it's a particular pleasure um, also for me to be uh, hosted in this uh, forum, uh, this uh, seminar series uh, in the honor of Professor, late Professor Battistini is uh, uh, revealing to be extremely successful and uh, I'm uh, grateful I can give my own contribution. Um, the Collegio Superiore and uh, uh, together with it, the, the mentorship that I've received uh, initially in the first couple of years uh, during my studies there uh, from Professor Braga and later uh, during the time of the Collegio and uh, later on throughout my career by, uh, by Professor Capranico have been uh, a, a game-changing uh, experiences for me. Uh, they have on one hand, through the interdisciplinary education that I received at the college, as uh, Professor Braga was uh, uh, stressing, uh, I uh, had the opportunity to keep my mind open and uh, pursue a, a, an interdisciplinary uh, type of study. Uh, counteracting a little bit the specifics uh, and the technicalities that then progressing in a scientific career brings along. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the experience at the college and the mentorship I received there um, prepared me and made me uh, competitive for uh, the international environment uh, at the different institutes where, where I have been. Uh, so I'm happy that I can come back and contribute uh, with this lecture. Um, it is uh, going to be a, a lecture that will mix uh, some basic concepts in biology, um, hopefully accessible to all those of you that are not necessarily familiar with biochemistry and molecular biology, um, together with, uh, with some hints, uh, especially in form of uh, what I hope are attractive movies uh, of, uh, of some of the results uh, that uh, the community and my, uh, myself, my lab as well, uh, have obtained uh, in the last uh, few years. And it's going to be uh, about a topic uh, that not only matches with my own uh, research uh, experience and expertise, uh, but that is also, I feel, uh, very timely uh, because it's uh, having a, um, a profound impact on our uh, society just these days. Uh, both uh, in negative form of this uh, tragic pandemic that we are all experiencing, but also in that try to stress this uh, at several points in my talk uh, because of uh, discoveries that are being made uh, in the field of RNA uh, in RNA-based therapy and that could have a, a positive impact on our uh, societies in the future. I'll divide my talk in two uh, parts. In the first part, I'll uh, describe to you uh, some of the key biological properties played by this fascinating uh, molecule that we call RNA. And in the second part of the talk, I'll uh, describe um, how we are learning to use RNA uh, for therapy. <clears throat> the slides in the first part of the talk uh, will be all uh, organized in the following way. Uh, at the top of the slide, you will see a timeline. Uh, I'll try to introduce the different concepts uh, in uh, somehow uh, the same chronological order uh, as uh, uh, the discoveries uh, that I'll talk about have been made. I'll dedicate the core of the slide to uh, illustrate also by means of some uh, sketches, uh, the uh, pathways, the biological processes that I will introduce uh, little by little. And for those of you that are instead more uh, into the field and uh, uh, that are interested to uh, go back to the original sources that I've used, I'll uh, report the references <clears throat> and uh, some marks uh, to keynote uh, those uh, fundamental steps, those fundamental studies that have uh, signed our progresses uh, in the understanding of the different roles that RNA plays uh, in biology. The key pathway and bio biological process that we will be talking about throughout this talk is the, gene, the, the pathway of gene expression. Uh, this is the most fundamental pathway that any living cell uh, has to uh, put in place uh, to ensure its survival and reproduction. Gene expression essentially consists in converting the genetic information that, as you're all probably well familiar with, our cells store in their core in the form of a, a biological molecule called the DNA, 
convert this genetic information into proteins, which are different type of biological polymers. DNA is made of nucleotides and comes in this characteristic double-stranded helical form. Proteins are series of amino acids and fold into different uh, highly sophisticated three-dimensional structures. So once the genetic information goes from DNA to proteins, the proteins are the effector of the major, most important biological functions. The proteins are responsible for recognizing and utilizing the nutrients that we eat, for caring and utilizing the oxygen that we breathe, providing us in our cells with the energy we need for survival. The proteins are responsible for cell um, duplication, uh, reproduction, uh, differentiation in the different tissues that compose uh, our body. So gene expression, when we talk about gene expression, we don't just talk about uh, a niche, uh, a small uh, biological pathway. Um, we talk about the real essence uh, of life. And as you will see throughout the talk, RNA plays uh, vital uh, roles at different stages of gene expression. Historically, the first role assigned to RNA has been that of a messenger of the genetic information. In other words, the genetic information stored in our DNA is copied into this similar type of polymer. Again, uh, a series of nucleotides, uh, very similar building blocks to uh, DNA, but coming in this uh, characteristic single, not double-stranded helical um, shape. Uh, and once the information is copied into this messenger molecule, it is then translated uh, into proteins by dedicated uh, machineries. And so very soon, uh, we also realized, the community also realized that uh, these very machineries that ensure translation, these protein synthesis factories, they themselves are also composed uh, of uh, RNA. In this particular case, we're talking about an RNA that uh, takes the shape of this uh, uh, sandwich molecule uh, and that goes under the name of ribosomal RNA and is coadjuvated uh, by a transfer RNA that has a characteristic cloverleaf structure here. That, that's why I use these uh, sketches for you to graphically recognize these molecules throughout the talk. These are RNAs that do not possess information to code and produce a protein. Yeah, instead, they work as RNA as such, as highly structured molecules that catalyze a specific biological process. Here we come, therefore, to the second function uh, that I want to highlight for RNA, that of a biocatalyst. And there are more of such uh, RNA enzymes. There are some, for instance, that help the maturation of these uh, protein synthesis machineries so that they can adopt their proper uh, three-dimensional structure to be uh, efficient uh, catalytic molecules. All these RNA enzymes, as I am trying to stress, are highly structured molecule and only thanks to their sophisticated three-dimensional structure can they uh, perform this biological reaction of protein synthesis. And so, throughout the last few decades, we have gathered a very detailed understanding of the molecular mechanisms of the ribosome and how protein synthesis occurs through the scientific advances and technological advances in the specific field of structural biology, because we are looking at structure molecules. With structural biology techniques, we obtain very detailed photographs pictures at very high resolution, atomic resolution of any structured uh, biological machinery. Thanks to the efforts of structural biologists throughout the years, we have obtained snapshots of the ribosome in the process of catalyzing protein synthesis at different stages. And then it is possible to put together all these individual snapshots and produce these fascinating molecular movies that are based on experimental data from techniques such as X-ray crystallography or cryo-electromicroscopy, and that give us a cartography, very detailed cartography of how the ribosome works. Uh, 
Here you recognize the sandwich structure of the ribosome and the tRNAs that come into the active site, the mRNA messenger that is being read and the protein that is being synthesized amino acid by amino acid and that folds when it uh, exits uh, the ribosomal uh, core. It is quite fascinating, I like to add, um, to be able to see these molecules work at such high resolution and to be able to visualize them in action because we are essentially the first generation in humankind throughout hundreds of thousands or millions of years that have such a detailed understanding of such a basic uh, biological component. There are more catalytic RNAs that ensure that gene expression can progress. These are RNA molecules that uh, participate and facilitate the early stages of gene expression, that uh, copying uh, step uh, by which the genetic information goes from DNA into the messenger RNA. I told you that uh, DNA is transcribed into the messenger, but actually I was oversimplistic. This is not a single step process. It goes through an intermediate step by which a precursor molecule is uh, first synthesized, which is composed of RNA, but it contains both the coding uh, sequence uh, of the mature messenger and also non-coding uh, sequences that are called the introns. Now the coding sequences that are called the exons need to be uh, cut out of this precursor, ligated together to produce the mature messenger RNA, which is then uh, ready for uh, trans being translated into a protein. This cut and paste mechanism that joins together the exons and excises uh, the introns is called splicing and it is catalyzed by the so-called self-splicing introns or the spliceosomal uh, ribonucleoproteins. These are RNA machineries where the RNA is the catalytic uh, effector. Again, as catalytic molecules, these are highly structured uh, uh, molecules, biological macromolecules, and therefore we could study them over the years thanks to structural biology uh, techniques. And here uh, I'm pleased to show some of the contributions that I and my lab uh, have done. Uh, these are uh, projects that I started when I was a postdoc uh, in the Pile lab at Yale and that I continued now uh, with my lab here at EMBL using crystallography. We have captured one of these splicing machineries uh, at different stages of catalysis. Uh, identifying all the atoms with very high precision in the active site uh, and visualizing therefore the splicing reaction just uh, as it happens here. You see in a minute the breakage of a bond between an exon and uh, an intron. Here the bond is broken, the splicing has occurred. And we see this at high resolution and we can also model very precisely the dynamics uh, of these molecules throughout the splicing cycle. And we can do this by putting together our crystal structure with the help of uh, computational biology. And here we were assisted by a fantastic lab uh, at uh, one uh, prestigious Italian institution, the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova. The, the Vivo lab uh, expert in molecular dynamics uh, helped us uh, uh, model and uh, produce this video of uh, this uh, splicing machinery throughout the different stages uh, of the splicing cycle. So, so far I've uh, described to you the role of RNA as a messenger of genetic information and that uh, of a catalyst of biological reactions. Now I want to spend the next couple of slides by telling you how RNA can also act as a regulatory molecule uh, to fine tune and control this uh, fundamental gene expression pathway. The first example I would like to make uh, is that of uh, uh, the regulation of translation by means of uh, specific RNA molecules that are called the short interfering RNAs or silencing RNAs. These are uh, short molecules of RNA that have the property of being complementary 
to specific messenger. Because of this complementarity, this siRNA can recognize the messenger and base pair to it, transforming it from a single-stranded uh, uh, structure to a double-stranded structure, which is poised for recognition by certain cellular machineries that degrade uh, the messenger. This is a way by which the cell controls and fine tunes the expression level of certain proteins uh, by uh, degrading uh, excess messenger RNA and therefore uh, stopping uh, the translation. You will appreciate more the importance of this mechanism later on when I'll talk about uh, some of the therapeutic potential that RNA has uh, in the clinics. Another regulatory role that RNA plays still in regulating translation is contributed by highly structured RNA motifs that occur at the two sides uh, of messenger RNA. Again, before I omitted voluntarily a uh, little part of the, of the story, the DNA is transcribed into the precursor mRNA. This is spliced into the mature RNA, but this mature RNA doesn't contain only the protein coding uh, sequences. It also contains extremities that are not carrying any protein coding information, but that have important regulatory roles. For instance, elements at the so-called five prime terminus of messenger RNA are uh, able to recognize uh, external molecules coming from the environment where the cell is thriving. And as such, uh, they, these molecules, for instance, could be nutrients, vitamins, or toxin, um, when they are recognized by these uh, RNA motifs, these RNAs switch conformation, hence their name riboswitches, and in their different conformations, they can tune, they can bind and stimulate or repress the ribosomal RNA to favor or unfavor the translation of a specific protein. So for instance, if there is a toxin in the environment and a riboswitch detects it, it stimulates uh, the ribosome to enhance the production of a particular gene that maybe codes for a protein that is able to uh, break down, uh, eliminate uh, the particular toxin so that the cell can survive. Again, this is a regulatory mechanism that relies on a specific, on a highly structured RNA that specifically recognizes external metabolites. And finally, the last uh, regulatory role that I want to discuss uh, is that um, of um, a more recently discovered class of uh, non-coding RNAs, the so-called long non-coding RNAs. These molecules act most prominently uh, in the nucleus at the level of uh, transcription. And they facilitate or repress the transcription of certain genes. These molecules, as I just said, are, have been discovered or their importance have been appreciated only uh, very recently. And moreover, these are very complex uh, RNA molecules. As their name suggests, they are very long uh, and therefore uh, still difficult to study and understand mechanistically. But my lab is uh, very uh, interesting in uh, elucidating the molecular mechanism of this long encoding RNA. And we've recently obtained an important breakthrough uh, by which we could take the first photographs, if you want, uh, of one specific link RNA in two different forms, in a form that is biologically active, and in the case of our particular target, is able to facilitate tumor repression. Uh, and uh, we could see that in this state, these molecules particularly compact, whereas in an inactive form, uh, because of some mutations, um, where it is uh, unable to stop tumor formation, uh, it adopts a much more uh, flexible, unstructured form. As you can see from these representations, we are still uh, at an early stage of uh, visualizing uh, these molecules. The resolution is still not uh, that uh, sophisticated uh, atomic resolution uh, that we could achieve previously for the 
other catalytic RNAs that I showed you. But um, the goal is in the future year, now that we've understood that uh, structure plays an important role for the function of these complex RNAs, uh, the future is to try to improve the resolution of this uh, data and uh, use uh, high resolution approaches so that hopefully we can provide you with um, molecular movies also for these link RNAs in the future. But uh, I was interested uh, to stress um, the, the, this achievement and uh, the result uh, of this work uh, because um, this was a joint effort um, that my lab has put together, uh, not only with colleagues here at the Structural Biology Institute uh, on campus uh, in Grenoble, uh, but also involving colleagues uh, both at another uh, important Italian site, uh, the Cibio Department of the University of Trento and crucially uh, involving the contribution of a very close friend of mine, former uh, colleague uh, at the Collegio Superiore, Paolo Annibale, who is now senior scientist at the Max Delbruck Center uh, in Berlin. And finally, uh, I want to spend a word uh, to describe to you how RNA can tune this gene expression pathway even when it comes from outside the cell as an exogenous molecule. So far, all the RNAs we have described are RNAs that are produced and act within a particular cell. And, and we have described how these allow and regulate gene expression within the cell. But what happens if uh, a pathogen uh, brings in exogenous RNA. And we're all too familiar with the uh, uh, unfortunate case of this uh, RNA virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is a virus that has an RNA genome. And therefore, when it infects uh, our cell, it delivers uh, not only its protein components, but also its uh, genomic uh, RNA uh, into, into the cells. And all these viral elements, the proteins and the RNA itself as well, uh, they hide hijack the uh, expression pathway of human genes uh, at all possible stages uh, to ensure that and to maximize the production of the viral protein. So to ensure that it's the virus that replicates and not uh, the human cells. Luckily, uh, the host, in this case, the human cells have also developed ways to recognize these exogenous components, also the exogenous RNA, and trigger uh, immune uh, responses to counteract the infection. So from this part of the talk, you, um, uh, I have guided you uh, through key cellular processes where RNA is uh, intimately implicated. So you won't be surprised to know that RNA is also crucially connected uh, to diseases. Whenever there is a misfunction in these processes that involve RNA, that involve RNAs, um, severe diseases emerge, uh, ranging from congenital to developmental disorders, metabolic disorders, cancer, and uh, pathogenic infections, uh, as I mentioned in my last slide. So the question is whether we can exploit or target RNA uh, for therapy. Now, if we want to do so, we need to uh, consider the specific properties of the different classes of RNA that I guide you through and uh, analyze how we can best exploit these properties for drug design. Perhaps the most uh, obvious case is that of uh, the catalytic RNAs. These are, as I stressed out, um, highly structured molecules um, similar to proteins, and therefore they are suitable targets for uh, small molecule drugs. The vast majority of the compounds that we buy in the pharmacy are small molecules that target highly structured uh, molecules, mostly proteins, uh, and inhibit or control regulate uh, their function. We can do the same for potentially for catalytic RNA. And then instead, uh, uh, we can use the exploit the coding potential of the messenger RNA, uh, perhaps to uh, convey uh, information inside the cell for uh, synthesis of a 
drug, uh, in inverted commas, uh, directly in the cell. And you'll understand better later from a specific example that I'll make. Or we can use the regulatory potential of RNA uh, regulatory molecules uh, to use directly these molecules as drug uh, per se especially in these last two cases where uh, we directly use RNA uh, and administer it directly to the patient, uh, we need to just keep in mind that um, it's difficult to do it with a naked uh, pure RNA per se, because pretty much as I mentioned when what happens with uh, pathogenic uh, infections, uh, RNA is labile and therefore rapidly degraded, recognized as exogenous molecule and rapidly degraded uh, by uh, our cell. Uh, optimization uh, is therefore needed if we want to use RNA as such uh, in, uh, in therapy. So in the second part of my talk, I will now guide you through examples, specific examples of how uh, we can use uh, and exploit RNA uh, in the therapy. And I'll start uh, by telling you how RNA can be a suitable drug target. Let's imagine the following pathology an infection disease where our body has been infected by a bacteria, a fungus uh, that, has, um, uh, that is creating uh, a disease. Now, both the cells of our body and the cells of the pathogens um, express their genes following the same mechanism as I have described to you uh, until now, except that the specific molecular machineries that are responsible for these gene expression processes in the different organisms have evolved over evolution and are therefore not identical. So hypothetically, if we could design a drug that specifically inhibits the ribosomes of the bacteria or uh, fungus, but not our uh, human ribosomes, then we would kill the pathogen with little to no um, side effects uh, for our own cells. And this is exactly what happens uh, with a vast class of uh, antibiotics, um, of which uh, here I report the example of gentamicin, which is the active principle of a widely used uh, antibiotic cream, gentalin. Well, thanks to biochemical and also structural biology effort, we now know how exactly gentamicin acts. And we know that it uh, does so by stalling, by binding to the core and stalling uh, the ribosome of pathogens and not the human ribosome. Uh, here you see exactly the binding mode of gentamicin, which I'm highlighting here uh, over the uh, ribosomal core uh, of, uh, of this uh, particular ribosome. And, uh, and uh, by doing so, uh, gentamicin is one, is one of those compounds that is able to inhibit protein synthesis specifically in certain pathogens. Now we know this uh, um, mechanism uh, since, uh, since quite a long time. Uh, instead, we haven't been able to efficiently target other catalytic RNA, different from the ribosome, uh, with um, small molecules. But uh, we are at a potentially important turnaround point now in the history of drug discovery uh, because there has been a remarkable breakthrough just last year. Let's imagine a different disease, a disease that originates from uh, the production of an incorrect protein. Uh, and this incorrect production is due to the uh, incorrect sequence of the corresponding messenger RNA uh, because of uh, mistakes or misfunctions uh, at the level of the splicing machineries that are, as I remind you, also highly structured uh, as, uh, as the ribosome. So if we could design a small molecule that can uh, facilitate the correction uh, or that could inhibit those uh, um, mistakes uh, in uh, the splicing process, uh, we could uh, produce a correct mRNA, a correct protein, and have a healthy organism. 
This is uh, what has uh, been achieved recently with a compound that has just received uh, approval from the Food and Drug Administration last year to treat uh, a debilitating disease called the spinal muscular atrophy, and that binds uh, the RNA component uh, of one uh, subunit of uh, one of these splicing uh, machineries. The next example I want to make is uh, on the use of RNA uh, as a drug molecule itself. Here, um, we need to imagine a different disease uh, that results from the uh, excessive production of a specific protein that accumulates in the cell uh, in our body and uh, causes uh, cellular malfunctions. Now, to treat such a disease, we will need to act uh, by uh, possibly decreasing the levels of uh, production of, uh, of this particular protein. And we could do so uh, by degrading uh, its corresponding messenger RNA. If you remember from uh, my first part of the talk, we, have a, we do have a way to do so uh, by using those silencing RNAs that have been discovered about 10, 15 years ago. And indeed, uh, uh, actively uh, research uh, has been carried out to uh, optimize the use of this silencing RNA for specific uh, pathologies. And again, it's a matter of just the last couple of years uh, that the first two uh, silencing RNAs have been approved for use in the clinics uh, against neuropathologies or uh, hepatic pathologies uh, that result exactly from the um, misfunction I mentioned before, an excessive accumulation of a specific uh, protein. And if you are interesting, uh, interested to, uh, to visualize more graphically and in a catchy way the mechanism of action of these uh, silencing RNAs, I encourage you to watch this particular YouTube video uh, where the mechanism of uh, this uh, patiziran uh, molecule is described. Instead, I want to move on and bring now an example of how we can use the coding properties of RNA, of the messenger RNA, uh, for uh, delivering drugs as drug vectors. And here I would like to bring uh, up the examples uh, of the uh, mRNA vaccines uh, that uh, we have uh, recently just uh, all become familiar with. I just need to make a premise here um, to tell you that one uh, standard routinary way uh, that has been used in the past for vaccine production has been that of uh, producing a particular viral protein in the lab, purify it at high purity, formulate it and deliver it into patients so that um, this protein could trigger mm. an immune response um, in, the, uh, in the patients, the production of specific antibodies ready for recognizing this protein again later at the time of a real infection and neutralize the pathogen, the virus. This is a way that has been taken since many decades now, for instance, led to the development of vaccines uh, against uh, pertussis or hepatitis B. However, this uh, pipeline has some drawbacks because um, those of you that have uh, already had experiences in uh, molecular biology, biochemistry, cell biology lab know that uh, protein purification is not trivial, especially when one wants to achieve a level of purity suitable for delivery into a patient. And moreover, the processes uh, involved, the protocols involved uh, in protein purification uh, have to be often re-optimized for every new target protein that one wants to study. And therefore, in this particular case, for every new virus that should be uh, identified. There is a potential workaround um, because uh, if we could uh, stop uh, the production, uh, the lab production at the level of the messenger RNA and uh, deliver it uh, into the patient to induce our own uh, human cells to produce the viral protein, uh, then uh, the protein would already be in our organism to trigger the immune response and the antibody production. <clears throat> This is uh, uh, exactly what has been achieved uh, in the last one year. 
um, by two independent different companies that have um, generated uh, these novel uh, mRNA vaccines against the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, to treat uh, COVID-19. Now, you may wonder uh, why has this technology not been used uh, earlier um, if uh, uh, we know the uh, central dogma of biology since the 50s and uh, uh, since it seems uh, so trivial uh, that and obvious uh, that uh, stopping uh, production uh, at the RNA level in the lab uh, would be advantageous uh, considering the uh, difficulties in purifying proteins um, that I uh, mentioned before. I uh, would like to spend a slide uh, on this because um, I think it's important, uh, especially for those of you not uh, perhaps familiar with uh, bi biochemistry and molecular biology, to appreciate that the, uh, this uh, discovery um, and this technological advance, which seemed uh, so timely and, uh, and fast uh, during this pandemic, is not the result of uh, approximative and uh, rushed uh, science uh, performed just in the last couple of months, uh, but it is actually the uh, result of um, uh, more than a decade long uh, basic uh, biology and, uh, and uh, pharmaceutical technology studies uh, that that uh, made us ready just on time uh, to face this uh, pandemic timely uh, with, uh, with these novel vaccines. Because if one takes um, just the pure sequence of the mRNA coding for this immunogenic uh, spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, one would have uh, very little hope uh, of success, um, certainly not of having antibodies produced and uh, most likely also not of having any uh, protein, uh, viral protein produced by our cells, just because this exogenous RNA as I mentioned before, would be readily recognized and degraded by our body. So it took many years to understand how to optimize the sequence uh, of uh, mRNA for efficient uh, delivery into patients to ensure their stability, to ensure that they are efficiently recognized by the cells for translation, and to optimize novel technologies to ensure that um, the RNA is uh, indeed delivered and enters into uh, the cells of our uh, organism. So all these uh, uh, studies that have gone on uh, somehow in the dark for the non-specialized audience uh, over uh, the last several years uh, have been fundamental to bring us now to this point uh, where uh, we can have two uh, different uh, vaccines uh, to treat um, efficiently, as it seems, from clinical trials uh, infections from SARS-CoV-2. Actually, uh, it's uh, not only in our best interest to um, ensure and, and give our contribution uh, to uh, prove that this technology can be efficient against SARS-CoV-2. It's not just in our interest to uh, save ourselves from this pandemic. It's also in our interest because if this technology proves to be true, uh, it may have uh, important impact um, for future medicine. I mentioned before that uh, producing proteins in the lab is challenging and needs to re be re-optimized for every new target. Well, producing mRNA is uh, potentially less challenging, but most importantly, it doesn't require significant optimization, no matter which sequence we want to produce, no matter which protein we want to produce. And therefore, with the same technology, if successful, um, we could in the future uh, produce uh, a more generalizable uh, vaccination uh, approach by producing uh, pretty much any uh, immunogenic viral protein that we are interested in. There is actually more to the story because um, a lot of this technology is actually not being developed uh, to target uh, infectious diseases and viral infections in particular, uh, but to target cancer. 
And uh, uh, the reason for this is that um, the production of mRNA is the same, no matter if it's about a viral protein or any other protein. And so we could uh, potentially think of using this technology uh, for um, inducing our body uh, to produce antibodies against epitopes, against proteins specific of uh, particular cancer cells to trigger our immune response to counteract uh, and neutralize uh, tumors. In the last couple of slides, I want to mention uh, before concluding a final uh, technology that could have, that doesn't have yet, but could in the future play a role uh, in therapy. And that's, uh, and that still involves RNA, this time as part of what I call here a drug machine. I'll uh, um, be more clear in the next couple of slides. Here we are looking at genetic diseases and how to possibly cure genetic diseases. Genetic diseases are challenging because uh, they originate from mutations in our very permanent genetic material, the DNA, which is the source of all this uh, gene expression, uh, of information allowing all this gene expression pathway. If there's a mutation on the DNA, uh, we would produce, our cells would produce a mutated messenger RNA, which would be translated in a mutated protein, and mutated protein can be sources of diseases. So one uh, technology that has been discovered um, uh, recently or that has been uh, studied uh, recently with the particular um, objective of uh, understanding uh, its potential in human therapy is the so-called uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology. CRISPR-Cas9 is a RNA uh, protein machinery uh, that can specifically recognize DNA and change its sequence. So we could potentially think of using it to uh, correct uh, mutations in our DNA, um, repair uh, the DNA and uh, cure the disease in this way. Uh, actually, this approach has already been used, as you're probably uh, familiar with, um, uh, from um, news that uh, have uh, uh, made, made the headlines of, uh, of the media uh, in recent years has already been attempted on, on humans. Um, however, um, must be uh, cautious uh, that the modifications on the uh, genetic material and uh, the fact that this uh, technology is still not um, um, free from uh, potentially creating off-target effects uh, raises uh, some uh, ethical concerns. If you want to know more about the specific mechanism of CRISPR-Cas9 and all the considerations that need to be taken uh, into consideration for the use in, in the clinics, uh, I uh, encourage you to uh, connect and watch online uh, this interesting TEDx talk um, delivered uh, a few years back uh, by another uh, close friend of mine, um, again, former student of the Collegio, uh, Carla Portulano. What I instead want to mention here is of a second type uh, of uh, genetic uh, engineering technology that was discovered just a few months after Carla delivered her TEDx talk. And that still involves a CRISPR-Cas uh, machine. Uh, here, uh, however, with a different protein endonuclease, Cas13, um, which uh, um, makes it suitable to recognize RNA uh, instead of DNA and correcting RNA sequence. So again, uh, this is a technology that has been uh, discovered just very recently. Um, it's detailed uh, mechanism and potential to be exploited in the clinic are still uh, not fully understood, uh, but um, uh, it may represent uh, an important tool uh, for uh, future um, targeting uh, of uh, genetic diseases uh, in a uh, personalized uh, medical manner. 
So uh, this is uh, the end of my talk. I just want to wrap up in two slides. Uh, what I told you today is that RNA uh, plays uh, fundamental biological functions as a messenger of genetic information, as a catalyst of uh, biological reactions, as a regulatory molecule, and can also uh, be used to trigger uh, responses, uh, immune responses from the organism. As such, uh, RNA uh, can be uh, a very uh, powerful potential uh, target for therapy, uh, and, uh, but we are just now learning how to use this molecule to cure diseases. We are doing so either by uh, learning how to develop uh, specific drugs uh, that target structured RNAs or uh, how to engineer um, regulatory RNA to fine tune biological processes or how to engineer uh, pharmacologically uh, messenger RNA to deliver uh, to the cells um, uh, certain uh, proteins uh, and trigger uh, immune responses against uh, pathogenic infections and in the future possibly also certain cancer types. And finally, um, we are discovering RNA, sophisticated RNA machineries uh, that are able to um, manipulate um, our uh, genetic material and that can be uh, potentially of great help uh, for the cure of uh, genetic diseases uh, in a personalized way in the future um, if we learn how to use these uh, tools uh, in a safe uh, and ethical uh, manner. I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, Francesco, a very close friend of mine, currently at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, a former speaker in this seminar series and a colleague uh, at the Collegio uh, before for his uh, uh, critical comments uh, on the slides while I was preparing this seminar. I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions uh, if you have. <laughs>